An estimated 5 million people in the United States have a hernia, but less than a million of them will go to a doctor about it. Today on Being Well, we're talking with a general surgeon about the types of hernias and options to fix them. Stay tuned. For over 50 years, Horizon Health has been keeping you and your family healthy. And although some things have changed, Horizon Health's commitment to meet the ever-changing needs of our community has remained the same. Horizon Health, 50 years strong. They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances the ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted, compassionate care, right here, close to home. Carl is redefining healthcare around you, innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it. Investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare, Carl, with Health Alliance, is always at the forefront to help you thrive. Thank you so much for joining us today for Being Well. I'm your host, Lacey Spence, and today we are welcoming a new guest to the show. We've got Dr. Todd Bierman from Sarah Bush Lincoln. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Of course, and so you are a general surgeon, correct? Yes. So yes. how did you get into that? How'd you end up at Sarah Bush? Um, well, I grew up in the area, so I grew up just outside of Diedrich, so, um, you know, through training, went to Lakeland, was in St. Louis for a couple years, Chicago for a few years doing uh, medical school, then I've been in Mobile, Alabama the last five years doing my general surgery residency, and then, you know, this is home, so it wasn't, wasn't a hard choice. I kind of knew I was always going to eventually move back, and mm -hmm. I knew a lot of friends and family who worked for Sarah Bush, and so they... You know, whenever they said that there was a potential opening, I, you know, got a hold of them and yeah. it's been, been good ever since, so. I feel like I hear that a lot. People like to come back to this area and mm -hmm. just love central Illinois. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, not a whole lot to do, but if you grow up here, you're, you're used to it. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of, it's, I mean, there's plenty to do if you, if you, you know. It's a slower pace. Yeah, exactly. And you can appreciate Ex that. Exactly, for sure. Exactly. So as a general surgeon, you cover kind of a wide variety of uh, body things. Yes, <laughs> pretty much talk about that? everything, like head to toe. Um, there's a, like there's a few things that we don't operate on that you have to have extra training for. But like I said, hernias, appendixes, gallbladders. Um, you know, I do colonoscopies and EGDs. Remove colons for all sorts of reasons. Um, we do um, breast cancer and remove. Um, you know, do the breast cancer treatment. Having the the you know, the oncologist and the cancer center there, they, they refer a lot of the, the cancer patients to the general surgeons if something needs to be removed or followed along. So I get a lot of patients from them, but yeah, kind of everything, even like little skin lesions, you know, people come into the office with a lump or a bump and want it removed and we, we can take it off in the clinic or, or even if it needs to go to the OR, we take it to the OR, so. And so with referrals, do you have to have a referral for all of those different procedures or? Um, typically, typically people, um, they'll, they'll go to their primary, uh, primary care physician and, and, you know, with a complaint or, you know, like I said, a skin lesion. And, and if the uh, primary care physician doesn't want to deal with it or, or can't treat it or something a little bit more complex than that they want to deal with, they'll send it to me for either a second opinion or, or for removal. And, like I said, sometimes I'm able to just take it off right in clinic, or if I need to, I'll just schedule them for a, a trip to the OR. So. Fair enough. So with those different procedures, do they have um, different types of healing, um, inpatient, outpatient? Yeah. So and, and yeah. So I do some inpatient. Most of my stuff now, and most of the stuff that we do in surgery is outpatient procedures. It's, you know, how it's amazing how much surgery and medicine has advanced. We used to. You know, even for little procedures, you would keep people in the hospital for days, keep them in the bed, don't get up and walk around, mm -hmm. you know, don't eat or drink. Now it's, you come in, you get the surgery done, and we want you home getting back to normal as quickly as possible, you know, and people do better and, and you know, <coughs> heal better. Um, that for the bigger cases, obviously, like the, taking out someone's part of someone's colon or, 
or more emergent cases that they have to come to the ER, lots of times it's going to require a day or a few days in the hospital um, for, you know, for close monitoring, making sure your labs are okay, and making sure that you're eating and drinking and your pain's controlled before we before we send you home safely. Before it's just the husband or wife trying to yeah, yeah. have well, that bedside manner. It's a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, educating, too. Some, some of it, the more extensive stuff, it, you need a couple days in the hospital with uh, yeah, your loved one at the bedside, learning how to take care of dressings and making sure that you know, they're comfortable going home. You know? um, and and always, there's always the cases where if someone's not quite comfortable go home, we, we send them to a, a rehab or a nursing home for a short stay, so that way they you know, can get a little bit stronger before going home. So, so a great yeah. option for transition. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all about safety. You know, we don't want to send anybody home if the, if the patient doesn't feel safe, if the family members don't feel safe. Uh, taking care of them, you know, we, you know, that's what really what it comes down to, making sure that the patient's safe. Sure. So let's talk a bit about um, hernias because mm -hmm. from what I read, most of the people that have them won't go to their doctor and get checked out. So what are they? Yeah. So they are, you know, there's multiple different types of hernias, whether it be um, an inguinal, uh, umbilical, ventral, um, hiatal. There's, it's kind of a, just a generalized term for it, a weak spot in your abdominal wall or in some musculature. So um, for say, like an inguinal hernia is down in your groin, there's you know, a weak spot in the fascia that is supposed to hold your, your internal organs, your bowel and everything up into your abdomen. Mm -hmm. If there's a weak spot over time and with wear and tear, lots of times those weak spots get bigger and bigger and, and it allows the bowel or any of the internal organs to herniate out of the abdominal cavity and so that can cause pain it can cause obstruction it can cause a, a myriad of symptoms and so what we do is we we fix those but like you said a lot of patients and a lot of people will will live with these for years they'll they'll feel a little little bulge or maybe uh, you know anytime they pick something up they feel a little strain or a tear and you know, and that's that's fine. You don't have to necessarily get your hernias fixed right away, but but over time, these tears and these these the hernias will get larger and get bigger. And typically, what happens is they get so symptomatic and so painful, or or they have to push them back in every time they're up and moving around. That um, that makes them go to the doctor. And sometimes it's it's. You know, you have to kind of educate the patients. Like, you know, if you would have came in, you know, a year or two ago, whenever it was just starting to get symptomatic, sometimes mm -hmm. it, it requires a lot less serious of a surgery. Because um, some people have to get them repaired emergently if, you know, if bowel is stuck out and you're worried about bowel dying or anything like that. So it, they can be surgical emergencies, but majority of the time, it can be fixed on an outpatient basis if, if they come in and, and we can, you know, we get ahead of it before it becomes extremely, you know, symptomatic or, or a problem. And what were the other types of uh, hernias? The, so like hiatal? Yeah, I hiatal. I've heard that one Yeah, before. so hiatal is a, is a different type of hernia. So the, um, you know, the inguinal, the umbilical, and the ventral, they're kind of more abdominal. Mm -hmm. um, the umbilical and ventral, kind of pretty much the same thing, kind of on your anterior abdominal wall or even on the sides of your abdominal wall. And they're kind of fixed the same thing as, same way as inguinals, usually with a, laparoscopic or open surgery and you had to put in mesh to reinforce the the um, the hernia hiatal hernias are actually the diaphragm so your left and right diaphragm that go up underneath your lungs and help with breathing where the esophagus goes transitions from the esophagus to the stomach is right at the hiatus of the diaphragm and that's why it's called a hiatal hernia and in some people that hiatus gets enlarged and it allows the stomach to sneak up into the chest cavity and typically people present with chronic reflux um, inability to lay flat at night because you know they have such bad reflux and and what's happening is the stomach is now up in the chest and that the natural um, you know, valve or the sphincter that allows the you know stomach acid to stay in the stomach is yeah. now compromised and so what we can do is go in and we pull the stomach back down and we close up that hiatus and tighten it up um, to restore the normal anatomy. So, so it's a different type of hernia, but it's, it's still a hernia. 
Sure, and so just the general terms then, a hernia is basically your organs are going where they're not supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, or it's just a weak spot, a weak spot in your abdomen or groin or, yeah, and, and it allows for potential for, yeah, organs to protrude or move to a space that they shouldn't be in. And, and like I said, that's when people typically get symptomatic. And so you said it feels kind of like a bulge or a pain. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of describe that pain? Um, it's usually very sharp, and lots of people will say like kind of a, a pulling. Um, uh, it's everybody's a little bit different in terms mm -hmm. of pain, but like, you know, and you have, and there's a lot of reasons to have generalized abdominal pain. But usually, if you feel a bulge, or if you feel a bulge and you can push it back in, and you can actually feel a bulge going back in, more than likely that's a hernia. Um, and lots of times the pain will get better once the hernia is reduced. It's pushed back in and everything's back in to where it should be. Lots of times that relieves the pain. Um, and so if you have a bulge and it, and it comes out and it stays out and you're unable to push it back in and you're having excruciating pain, that's a reason to present to the emergency department sure. or call your doctor immediately because that might require an emergent surgery. And most of the time, those patients will go to the emergency department because they're they're in such excruciating pain, and then and lots of times in the ER they'll they'll do like a CAT scan or or a physical exam and say yeah there's a, a hernia that I can't reduce, or a CT will show you know a hernia and there's bowel involved that looks compromised like maybe the blood supply to the bowel is getting cut off, mm -hmm. and so that's whenever they call the general surgeon and that's whenever that you know me or one of my partners will go and evaluate the patient you know do an exam and yes verify that there is a hernia and either try to reduce it because if it can be reduced lots of times you can hold off on an emergent surgery when you say reduce is that pushing I mean, it back, pushing in? It back okay. in yeah pushing it back into where you know the organs back into the abdominal cavity and if for some reason you can't get them pushed back in then you you have to actually go for an emergent surgery because there's potential for a bowel to be compromised, the blood supply to the bowel to be compromised, and you end up with with dead bowel, and mm -hmm. that can make you extremely sick, and that, you know, so. And then it just snowballs from there. Yes, exactly, exactly. That sounds like uh, kind of scary if you were to find yeah, that at home. Yeah, and the thing is, like, so hernias are extremely common. Um, you know, a lot of people have umbilical hernias, um, a lot of pediatric patients a lot of babies are born with umbilical hernias or inguinal hernias and over time like as kids sometimes they'll resolve and you won't operate on them right away you just kind of watch them mm -hmm. but if they persist into adulthood the the chances of a, a hernia closing on its own is is pretty much zero it you have the defect your body's not just going to close it over time it's more than likely it's just going to get bigger over time so again, if you find it when it's little, you can keep an eye on it, but if it starts becoming symptomatic, you need to let your doctor know. And so that's the most common one for children as you get older. Is there an age that you start seeing the other types? No, I mean, it, it's it, a lot of factors play into it, um, okay. especially nowadays a lot of high school kids are doing a lot of heavy, you know, lifting or yeah. weightlifting for <laughs> football, basketball, soccer, whatever sport it is, it seems like you have workout regimens now starting in high school. So we start seeing patients, even high schoolers who are starting to develop inguinal hernias or umbilical hernias or, or ventral hernias. And it's likely that they've probably had maybe, a, maybe had the hernia their entire life, but once they start really getting active and, and doing a lot of heavy lifting and weightlifting, that's whenever they start getting symptomatic. And that's whenever we're, we're, I feel like we're catching hernias earlier now because of that. But majority of the time and the majority of the, the hernias like that I do are inguinal hernias in middle aged to older men. And it's just kind of a, a wear and tear type of thing. Um, it's just the way our anatomy is, is set up. Um, men are much more prone to get inguinal hernias than women. Uh, you lucky of, fellas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's a trade-off. There's women do do things that that men don't have to do, which is, you know, like childbirth. <laughs> we got you there. Yeah, yeah. I think you kind of got us on that one. But um, but uh, yeah. So it's usually like middle-aged men, and that's a part. The part of the problem that with that is too is middle-aged men are like the least likely to go to their doctor. They're the least likely to mm -hmm. to take the time and get their yearly physical and. You know, if, if I'm 
if I'm not having to miss work or it's not bothering me that bad, I'll put it off, put it off, put it off. And then finally they present because they're in excruciating pain mm -hmm. or they can't go to work. And then it's like, again, they come in and it's like, you know, if you would have got this taken care of or looked at a couple years ago, I could have done this and you would have been back to work and would have not had any issues. And they wait and they wait and they wait and it becomes a bigger, a bigger deal. So it's a hard truth to swallow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know I'm, I'm guilty too. I don't, yeah. I don't go to my doctor like I should, but, <laughs> but, but anyways, yeah. so, um, other than reducing or surgery, like what are the surgical options? What's a, is there a hernia mesh? Yeah. So we, we typically, not all hernias need to be repaired with mesh, but w majority are. And you know, hate saying the word mesh because people actually a lot of patients that come in they're like oh you're going to use mesh mesh gets a bad rap because of the advertisements you see on tv uh, you know a lot of a lot of lawyers and and you know litigation around hey did you have this mesh put in and mm -hmm. it caused a complication but 90 plus some percent of all hernias are fixed with mesh and very very low complications from it the meshes that we use are safe and they're necessary to keep the hernia from coming back. The, the reason why you develop a, a hernia in the first place is typically because your tissue is, is not as healthy as it should be and it's weak, or, and you, you do stuff that strains and puts pressure on it. Without the, hernia, without the mesh, you're putting together poor tissue and the chances of it coming back is extremely high. So what we do is we will bring the tissue back together, then the mesh is just a reinforcement that your body will scar in and prevent reoccurrence of the hernia. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a necessary, not necessarily evil, but it's, it's necessary to, to prevent reoccurrence. It really dramatically reduces the rate of reoccurrence when using a mesh. And so other options to treat them, are they less invasive then? Since you said you were sending more folks home? Oh, so yes, yeah, so again, they. We've, we've transitioned from open surgeries and doing so many like big cases where you have to make a big incision to find the, the hernia defect and, mm -hmm. and get it put back together and get the mesh in. Majority of the cases I do now are, are, are laparoscopic, um, which means small incisions using a camera and we fix it from the inside. So I can take you know an incision that would have been 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters to fix this hernia, and I, I turn it into three half millimeter, half centimeter incisions and fix the hernia. And it's, you know, the data shows that it's just as good, if not better, than fixing it open. And, and let's say I'm not having pain yet. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way I can check myself to see if I start feeling that? Is it just kind of a poke around? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you feel like there's a bulge, yeah, you can, you can. Do a, your own physical exam and, yeah. and feel if if you feel something abnormal or feel a bulge and you you know and you think it's there, you know that's the time. Call your doctor and have them take a look at it. And if they if they think yes this is a hernia, they'll they'll either you know tell you what to do at that point in time or refer you to a surgeon for another you know another evaluation. And and like I said, lots of times. You know, some people get sent to me and, and they, they have a hernia, but again, they found it when it's early, it's really not symptomatic. Maybe they don't have a, a stressful job where they do a lot of heavy lifting, they maybe sit at a, at a, at a desk and, and the, the fact that, you know, the hernia might be there, but, but it might, the chances of it getting bigger and becoming an issue is really, really low. So we can do what we call like watchful waiting, mm -hmm. where, all right, we know you have a hernia, we know it's there, keep an eye on it. If it starts getting bigger, you think it's getting bigger, if you think it's getting more symptomatic, if, you, you know, if you're concerned at any point in time that it just something doesn't feel right or it looks different, call me or go to your doctor and get seen again. Um, just because you have a hernia doesn't mean you absolutely have to be operated on. Sure. Um, and sometimes it's, it's good to have the doctor tell you, all right, you have a hernia, let's keep an eye on it. Mm -hmm. You know, now, now, we, now we know that you have the diagnosis and we can stay ahead of it and we can take care of it if it needs taken care of. And we don't have, you don't have to be presenting to the emergency department and getting an emergent surgery. And sometimes that peace of mind is what, what people need as oh, well. for sure. Yeah. And so as a patient, are there any lifestyle changes you can make to reverse a hernia? So, yeah. So the, uh, the biggest thing is 
avoiding strenuous activity that's that's going to aggravate it mm -hmm. um, losing weight mm -hmm. is is a huge thing the um, intra-abdominal pressure um, is correlates to how you know how fast the hernia will develop so if you have less intra-abdominal fat that's less intra-abdominal pressure and that decreases your chance of the of the hernia getting worse so I always I always recommend weight loss, avoiding strenuous activity. You can, you can, people can use binders or trusses that kind of hold the hold your abdominal wall tightly together and prevent like stretching and prevent potential tearing of the fibers that would make the hernia worse. So sometimes we use those, um, but yeah, it's you know moving, you know, losing the weight is really a, a huge thing. And it makes the surgery easier, and it makes the recovery easier, and um, it makes the healing process fast, faster. So, And if I'm somebody who is carrying a little extra weight and needs to work on that, um, are there ways that, like, do I need to be extra careful as I'm working out so that I don't irritate that hernia further? Um, no, I mean, no, because ultimately losing the weight is going to kind of counterbalance the the potential complications from making the hernia hernia worse okay. I mean granted if you have a big ventral hernia and and you're and you want to go and you want to do a bunch of sit-ups or crunches that's probably going to irritate it so just be you, mindful yeah of be that. mindful okay. of it and and stick with cardio and just kind of generalize losing weight as opposed to trying to build muscle or do a lot of heavy lifting because the heavy lifting can cause it. I know it's kind of counter. But cardio is but hardio. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, I don't enjoy cardio either, so. But. And so um, also on the inside, can we talk um, very briefly about gallbladders and the appendix? Yeah, yeah, so gallbladders is actually the most common surgery that I do. Most common surgery we do as general surgeons mm -hmm. across the board, across the country. Uh, a lot of it has to do with some of it's hereditary. A lot of it, I think, has to do with America, the American diet. Mm -hmm. We develop we develop gallstones, um, you know, and that's the most reason, the most common reason I take it out is a lot of people present to their their primary care doctor or the emergency department with a new onset of right upper quadrant abdominal pain, kind of sitting right up underneath your rib cage, and lots of times it'll kind of radiate around the side, um, and it might last for. 30 minutes, it might last a few hours, and it gets a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And usually the first time it happens, lot, a lot of people won't, won't present, they won't call their doctor, they won't go to the ER because it's like, all right, it got better. Mm -hmm. Test the waters, maybe, maybe I won't. It could be a regular yeah, cramp. Yeah, exactly, it might just be gas and, and you know, this is a fluke. And then it starts happening more frequently and, and more common. And so then they call their doctor, or they go to the ER and they get um, an ultrasound and it shows stones or a CT scan and it shows you know gall stones or gall sludge or the, the gallbladder wall looks a little thick and then they get sent to me and then I kind of talk to them about gallbladder surgery and and mm -hmm. and again it's one of those things you catch it early it's it's an outpatient it takes 30 minutes to an hour to take out a gallbladder wow. and it's a lot easier and it's through small incisions it's a lot easier to do whenever it's not acutely inflamed and and all this inflammatory tissue around. If you if you come in early, whenever you start having symptoms, and we can get you diagnosed, and I can have you seen in the OR. You go home the same day. You're back to normal in a few days. It's it's again. It's all about early recognition and getting in early, so that way avoid avoid having to go to the emergency department. And then the same way with the appendix. The same thing with the appendix. Yeah. The appendix is more of a acute finding. It's it's. Usually, whenever you first get that flare-up of the appendix, it's bad enough, and you feel bad enough that you go to the emergency department. It's very, very rare to have someone refer to me or come to my clinic with right lower quadrant abdominal pain, and it's like, oh, you probably have appendicitis. It's, appendicitis is more of an acute finding, and you, you go and you take it out um, because they present to the emergency department, and they're usually usually pretty sick and in a lot of pain and and so you just take them to the OR you know that day or the next day and you take out their appendix and they go home you know and I'm it, sorry if I missed it what part of the body is the appendix oh it's in, like, down in the, the right lower quadrant lower. Part, yeah so lower than the gallbladder yeah yep gotcha. gallbladder's up here appendix is down there so yep 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 in our last minute here um, is there anything else in the the kind of trunk region of the body that folks should be looking out for pain wise um the, uh, not necessarily pain-wise, uh, but colonoscopies and EGDs. So mm -hmm. that's something that, that 
we as general surgeons we get trained on doing colonoscopies and EGDs and that's another thing at the age of 50 screening colonoscopies and mm -hmm. I know your most people's primary care doctors talk to them and colonoscopies aren't fun but the alternative to going a whole life without getting one and needing something emergently is it's a world of difference so come in whenever you turn 50 and and tell your primary doctor hey I need a colonoscopy and they'll get you set up and it's you know screening colonoscopies are not that bad <laughs> you know it's usually just the prep yes exactly the prep's not fun but it's better than it used to be it's yeah. a lot better than it used to be and we're we're constantly trying to come up with different preps that just make it easier for the patient and, and uh, make their lives a little bit better because you know it's stressful coming to the hospital and stressful prepping and taking a day off of work mm -hmm. to go get a to go get a colonoscopy and we're just trying to trying our best to make everybody as comfortable and 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 uh, make healthy the process make yeah healthy as possible make the the process as easy as possible so well if you've learned anything today it's see your doctor early don't let that pain go Dr. Bierman thank you for being yeah, here thank you <laughs> and thank you for joining us we will see you next time for being well Carl is redefining healthcare around you innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare Carl with Health Alliance is always at the forefront to help you thrive. They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances. The ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted compassionate care right here, close to home. For over 50 years, Horizon Health has been keeping you and your family healthy. And although some things have changed, Horizon Health's commitment to meet the ever-changing needs of our community has remained the same. Horizon Health, 50 years strong.